All right. Welcome to the uh, Thursday night New York Giants Preservation Society meeting. Today we have Dan Taylor. Dan is not only a member, but has uh, spoken at two of our Zooms already. And he's got uh, great pipes. <laughs> the For all of you in New York, uh, in New York City, you know he should be replacing both Cameron Maven and Carlos Beltran behind the mic because those guys are just god awful. Um, before we turn it over to Dan, just some other business. Next Wednesday, we're going to have a meeting, not Thursday, with Paul Kosak. Paul did a book called Chasing Willie Mays. They're really, really, it's a fun book. And uh, we are mentioned in the book, the group, as uh, Paul attended uh, the trophy tour. I believe it was 2015 trophy tour that the book was written. Uh, great, great, great like book. an excellent firefighter. <laughs> Thanks, Mars. A um, couple of other things. Uh, the Polo Ground area, they are talking about putting a possible uh, uh, monument there or plaques. And... Um, we had a little meeting the other day, a Zoom meeting, and they're, they're serious about this. There's going to be another meeting in September, um, whether to make like a little permanent Hall of Fame of players or, or uh, people who were uh, instrumental in the area, and also possibly having plaques of celebrated moments that happened at the polo grounds, and not just baseball, but baseball would be the majority of it. We shall see what happens with that. Um, before we get started, I'd like to give a special welcome to Kirk Washington. Kirk is uh, Kenny Washington's grandson who joined us, who's joining us tonight. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Dan. His new book was just out yesterday. Might have been a little earlier than yesterday, but on Amazon it said yesterday. The Untold Journey of Football Pioneer Kenny Washington. For those of you who don't know, Kenny Washington is really the football equivalent to Jackie Robinson. So without further ado, I turn it over to our member and just a, a wonderful man and a great writer and great broadcaster, Mr. Dan Taylor. Dan, it's all yours. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, guys. Uh, I guess I just clicked your screen and I'm good to go here with the PowerPoint. Uh, I think I have to give you the screen. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, share screen. And I think you do something on your end, then you're, then you're good. Okay. How Got it now? We good? Sounds good. All right. Floor is yours. Well, thanks, everybody. It's good to see you and always good to be with you. And this talk is titled The Almost Giant, Kenny Washington and the New York Giants. And this is from my uh, book that came out yesterday, Walking Alone, The Untold Journey of Football Pioneer Kenny Washington. And OK, there's probably one or two of you right now that are shooting me a Rodney look saying, you know, doesn't this guy understand we're the New York Baseball Giants Preservation Society and not the New York Football Giants Preservation Society? I get it. We're good. We're ready to rock and roll here. So who was Kenny Washington? For that, I'm going to turn it over to Groucho Marx to introduce Kenny Washington. Hmm. But who was Kenny Washington? Well, if you listen to Hall of Fame players that saw him play, he's the greatest football player to ever play the game. You see here, he had the speed to get around the outside and outrun defensive backs. He had the power to run off tackle and over linebackers. And what was extremely impressive about him, and that's kind of what Groucho was making a joke about, Kenny Washington could throw a football 100 yards in the air. And uh, just a remarkable, remarkable uh, talent whose coaches often said that he was even better uh, as a defensive player. And that is indeed Jackie Robinson on the receiving end of that, uh, that touchdown catch uh, against Washington State. As Gary alluded to earlier, Kenny is uh, the Jackie Robinson of the NFL. 
1946, he integrated the modern era of the National Football League, reintegrated the league overall, and he played three seasons with the Los Angeles Rams. Uh, at UCLA, he was the school's first ever first team All-America. He led UCLA to its first undefeated season in 1939 when he was a teammate there with Jackie Robinson. And they've only had two undefeated seasons in UCLA history. And he was the first UCLA athlete in any sport to have his number retired, his number, uh, in famous number 13. He was the winner of the 1939 Fairbanks Award. And this was really unique and really special because it preceded the Heisman Trophy. And where the Heisman was voted on by the writers, the Fairbanks Award was voted on by the players. All 1,600 college football players uh, had a vote and in 1939, Kenny Washington was the first and the only unanimous winner in the awards history. So while the players voted him the college football player of the year, he got very little consideration at all for the Heisman Trophy. And it's a pretty good understanding of why when you look at uh, different parts of the country and, and the votes that were cast. Uh, he was the most popular athlete in Southern California at that time. So popular that uh, in his movie, Thousand Dollars a Touchdown, Joe E. Brown uh, wore Kenny's UCLA number 13 jersey. So popular that as he came out of UCLA in 1940, this motion picture, While Thousands Cheer, by Million Dollar Productions, was written specifically for Kenny to star in. The film got very good reviews, but this is a, a holy grail of sports films. Nobody can find it. Uh, I think Kurt will probably share that I think their family has looked forever and, and I've gone through several resources in Southern California unsuccessfully. And uh, so if anybody's got some ideas and some leads, uh, this would be a phenomenal find if we could ever get a hold of this movie. But it did very well in 1940 when it came out. So what about baseball? That's what we're here for, right? We're not here to talk football. We're here to talk baseball. And, and I'm going to defer to Groucho Marx again to kind of tell us how baseball comes into the picture here. Dan, we don't hear his voice unless it's only me. Not hearing the voice? No. no. Darn. Uh, darn, got I, it, Max. But what he's, I, what he's telling think, Groucho is that baseball is his first love, and, and, uh, and many scouts felt that that was his best sport. Kenny really uh, made a name for himself in baseball initially in 1934, when he was uh, in high school. And that was a year before he kind of burst on the scene in football. And in the spring of 1934, Lincoln High and Fremont High in Los Angeles were head and shoulders above all the other high school baseball programs. And they were battling for the city title. Fremont High was a perennial power. And they had sent a number of players into professional baseball. Lincoln High was a sports minnow. Uh, they had not won many of any championships in any sport. And they were better known for academics and specifically drama. Uh, they sent a number of people to Hollywood uh, onto wonderful acting careers, Robert Young being one, Jeanette mm -hmm. Nolan, and uh, a teammate of, of Kenny Washington's, uh, who at that time was known as Robert Preston Meserby. When he became an actor, he dropped the last name, was known as Robert Preston and the Music Man. But these two teams in 1934 were battling for the city championship, and they, each team was led by a sophomore a 15-year-old sophomore. In the case of Fremont High, it was their third baseman, Bobby Doerr. And in the case of Lincoln High School, it was their shortstop, Kenny Washington. And while the two teams were battling for the city title, these two guys were battling for the city batting title as 15-year-old sophomores. The season was called off two weeks early because of a polio outbreak in Los Angeles. The health department put a stop on public gatherings that included high school baseball games. So Bobby Doerr barely edged out uh, Kenny Washington for the batting title. Kenny won the city home run title. And because of an upset loss just a couple of days before uh, by Lincoln High, Fremont High was crowned the champions. But the next year after Bobby Doerr had gone on into professional baseball, uh, he left school his sophomore year uh, to begin playing in the Pacific Coast League. Uh, Kenny Washington led uh, Lincoln High to the city championship in his uh, junior season. And then again, in his senior season, the season was called off short, this time for financial reasons. Kenny then moved on to UCLA. He played just one season of baseball. There's been a lot written about his baseball at UCLA, a lot of it wrong. 
uh, he only played one season of baseball. That was his sophomore year, 1938. He was the Bruins shortstop. And Kenny was the first African-American to play baseball at UCLA. Uh, he did not play as a freshman because they couldn't round up enough players to make up a freshman team. In his junior year, uh, the team had played in the uh, Pineapple Bowl in Hawaii. They came back after the baseball season had gotten uh, underway. And the football coaches had made promises to players of summer jobs. And they lined up a job for Kenny working in Warner Brothers. And uh, he elected to take that job rather than uh, come in late for baseball. Uh, he was the all-league shortstop that year. Had a tremendous season. Was uh, leading the league in, in hitting uh, up until the last three weeks of the season when he suffered uh, a pretty serious bout of the flu. He was hospitalized, and when he came back, uh, didn't hit very well the last few games of the season. Uh, one of his uh, more legendary feats came in a game at Stanford. This is Sunken Diamond uh, on the campus at Stanford. The Cardinals still play there to this day. And in a game in 1938, in April of 1938, Kenny hit one in the trees uh, beyond the right center field wall. He was the first right-handed hitter ever to hit one out the opposite way. Uh, the Detroit Tigers two years earlier had used this facility for spring training and nobody, uh, it was a big ballpark at that time, nobody was able to hit a home run. And for decades, uh, his was the most talked about home run in, in, in the history of this park and considered the longest home run hit uh, out of that ballpark. Uh, toward the end of the season, the San Francisco Examiner, their columnist wrote this about him, a leading hitter, best shortstop in the college baseball out our way is Kenny Washington of UCLA. Coaches of other teams say he has major league ability, but big league scouts aren't interested in him. Washington is a Negro. Very interesting matchups that season whenever UCLA and the University of California met up. It got a lot of added attention because of Kenny Washington and Sam Chapman. And the reason for this, both were the best player on their school baseball team, but they're also the best player on their school football team. Chapman was a third team All-America halfback at Cal, uh, Kenny the star football player at UCLA. And um, Washington led the league, California Interscholastic, Interscholastic Baseball League, with a 409 average. He finished second, I should say, in the league with a 409 average in league games, and he led the league in home runs. Sam Chapman uh, was 14th in the league in hitting with a 340 average. Yet at the end of the season, Sam Chapman signed with the A's and went straight to the big leagues. Never spent a day in the minor leagues and uh, walked right into the starting outfield of the Philadelphia Athletics. Had an 11-year career in the big leagues, got MVP votes and 46 All-Stars. So it kind of gives you a little measuring stick that as, as a high school player, Kenny was right there with the future Hall of Famer and Bobby Doerr and in college baseball. Certainly measured up uh, very well with Sam Chapman, who went on to have a terrific big league career. He, Kenny was a teammate uh, one season of football with Jackie Robinson. They became friends. Kenny really was a mentor to Jackie. Uh, a lot of people talked about how uh, when Jackie came into UCLA, you know, he, he had a, a volatile temper. And Kenny would take him on walks and, and really try to talk to him and, and mentor him. And they became very good friends. They, uh, contrary to things that have been written, they were never baseball teammates at uh, UCLA, Kenny only played his sophomore year in 38. Jackie only played his junior year, which was 1940. And then after his senior season of football, he left school to support his mother and, uh, and took a job and did not play baseball in 1941. To compare the two, uh, this was a very interesting uh, set of numbers. Kenny in his uh, 1938 season, uh, overall over the entire season hit 397. Um, he was hitting well over 400 before he got the flu. In Jackie's lone season at UCLA in baseball, Jackie hit 097. Kenny's greatest thrill, I think, really surprised me in researching this book. It happened in this ballpark. This is Wrigley Field, which was home of the Los Angeles Angels and a replica of the ballpark in Chicago. Uh, you know, you would think in, in, in Kenny's case that maybe his 92-yard touchdown run with the Rams against the Chicago Cardinals, which is still, to this day, the Rams franchise record for touchdown run from scrimmage, or maybe uh, his final college game when he walked off at the end of the game with USC before the largest crowd in college football history, 103,300 in the LA Coliseum, which gave him a 10 minute standing ovation that one of those two might've been his greatest thrill, but he said it happened in 1942. And Los Angeles at that time had a thriving winter baseball league, the Los Angeles winter league. And it was an integrated league, very rare in the country at that time. 
And Joe Peroni was the guy who created it and ran it. And he really went out of his way to recruit players from the Negro Leagues, worked on the team owners, to send players out. He had a lot of players from the American and National League and Pacific Coast League. So he had the uh, all black teams and all white teams. And some of the best players in the Negro League came out and played. Uh, cool Papa Bell, Satchel Page, Double Duty Ratcliffe, uh, just to name three. And many of these guys ended up making their offseason home in Los Angeles. And what was really very special about uh, this winter league was they would open it every year with an all-star exhibition game in Wrigley Field. And Joe Perrone would bring in a headliner. So in 1939, for instance, he brought in Bob Feller to pitch. In 1941, he brought in Joe DiMaggio to play. Uh, Ted Williams, or I should say 41, he brought in Ted Williams to play. Uh, DiMaggio came in one year. Jimmy Fox came in one year. And in 1942, uh, he had, now this is uh, some film footage uh, of uh, one of the games. And this is from, I believe, 1946, when Satchel Page came into play. But uh, what they did uh, in this particular year in 42, Satchel Page had committed that he was going to come in and play. And uh, right prior to the start of the LA Winter League, he pitched in the Negro World Series and pitched in every single game in that World Series. He, tele he sent a telegram to Joe Perrone after and said, I got a sore arm. I'm tired. I can't do it. Well, they were counting on having a headliner to draw a crowd and get this thing going. And they turned to Kenny Washington. Now, he had not played in maybe four years, not since his 38th season at UCLA. So Kenny was inserted in the lineup on the, the all-black team, hitting third and playing second base. The starting pitcher for the all-white team was Larry French of the Brooklyn Dodgers. French had gone 14-5 and five that previous season and pitched two scoreless innings in the All-Star game. So with two outs in the bottom of the first inning, Kenny Washington came up and deposited a fastball from Larry French into the last row of the bleachers in right center field. Rod Dato, the, who later became the legendary coach at the University of Southern California, and Kirk's father played for him, uh, he was a player in that game that day, and he said Washington could really slug the ball. French just stood there shaking his head. Three times, Kenny Washington was a central figure in efforts to integrate either the American or the National League. Uh, the first happened in 1940, and it was an innocent attempt in 1940. Larry McPhail always liked to come to Los Angeles in January for the start of the horse racing season. And I made a point of uh, putting a couple of these pictures in here for Mr. Lowenfish because Larry McPhail liked to rub elbows with the movie stars and he'd get with some of his baseball buddies who lived in the LA area. Fred Haney of the, of the St. Louis Browns at that time was one. And they would go to the track, either Santa Anita or Hollywood Park and, uh, and spend time hobnobbing with the movie stars. Well, Dave Farrell was a sports writer in Los Angeles and he, took advantage, he wanted to take advantage of McPhail's presence to really plant a seed. So he used his column as an open letter to Larry McPhail. And he wrote, buttering him up initially, I'm writing you this letter because I consider you far and away the most brilliant mogul. And then later in the letter, he said, you've been looking for a heavy hitting outfielder. Let me tell you about Kenny. You certainly can use him. And then he wrapped up his letter saying, baseball needs new vitality, new faces. Let's stop being ostriches and face a few facts. How about just being, plain, uh, being just plain sensible? Well, I think as we learn many, many years later after McPhail's passing and the public you know, finally being able to see his papers, he was the wrong guy to approach about integrating baseball. He was totally against it. But in 1943, baseball was really facing a crisis. Uh, we were in the middle of World War II and entire leagues were struggling. Uh, due to a lack of players. You had at the top end, big league stars like Bob Feller and Hank Greenberg uh, had joined the military. But all the way through the minor leagues, clubs were struggling to find players. And particularly in the Pacific Coast League, you can see the article, the San Francisco Seals uh, had just 17 players. Uh, Sacramento was in, in danger of, of being unable to field a team for a time. Even the Hollywood stars uh, uh, let it be known about two weeks before the start of spring training, that they only had 17 players under contract. Well, the sports editors of, of a couple of the uh, black newspapers in Southern California, the uh, Eagle and the Sentinel, approached uh, Oscar Reichow, the business manager of the Hollywood Stars, and Pants Rowland, the business manager of the Los Angeles Angels. And they pitched both men that 
they could fill their needs and that they should sign Kenny Washington. And they also presented them with a list of Negro League players who were uh, working at the, some of the aircraft and munitions factories in the Los Angeles area uh, and told them that, that some of these guys would be able to play either at night, you know, working around their, their shifts, weekends or nights. And the Hollywood stars said uh, that Charlie Root, the manager, was not interested and that they did have more players coming in. But Pants Rowland with the LA Angels said he would give Kenny Washington a shot and he would let him come to spring training in 1943. Well, several days past spring training began and these writers uh, had not heard anything back from Pants Rowland. So they contacted him again and he told the men that his manager, Bill Sweeney, was not in favor of it and that there would be no tryout for Kenny Washington. The uh, Board of Supervisors in Los Angeles uh, were apprised of this and they, they chastised both the Stars and the Angels. And uh, in, in their, at their meeting, they brought up, which I think was, it was something that struck me in researching this, uh, the Pacific Coast where no discrimination exists uh, at hotels or seats in the ballpark would be an ideal spot to begin a movement which now keeps some of the nation's finest athletes from participating in the national sport. And uh, such a fine prospect as Kenny Washington, who played football with distinction for UCLA, is effectively barred from playing baseball, the speaker of the board pointed out. And, and you know, it was something that really struck me researching this book, because you, you look at Kenny and Jackie, for that matter, and Woody Strode and the five African-American players on that 39 UCLA team. Well, they went into the same markets that the Pacific Coast League was playing in. They went to Seattle to play the University of Washington. They went to Oregon to play Oregon State and, and University of Oregon. They went to the Bay Area to play Stanford and Cal. And they didn't have problems with hotels for the teams, buses, trains. Occasionally, there, there was some issues in restaurants. But for the most part, it, it just struck me reading this in the you know, 2020 hindsight that the Pacific Coast League could have been the league where baseball was integrated. And they missed a golden opportunity in my mind. Uh, the supervisors unanimously voted a resolution deploring this discrimination and asking the baseball moguls to put an end to it. The third opportunity came in 1945. And in October of 1945, Montreal, at the direction of the Brooklyn Dodgers and Branch Rickey, signed Jackie Robinson. Branch Rickey at that time said that he was going to sign two African-American players to play for Montreal in the 1946 season. And there was a lot of lobbying going on. There were people within the Dodger organization that had their ideas on who the second player should be. Leo DeRocher wanted to see uh, Roy Campanella be that second player. Chuck Dressen was very much in favor of Johnny Wright, the pitcher for the uh, Homestead Grays, whom he had seen pitch in Army games uh, very, very well against uh, major league players on some of the Army base teams. But Kenny Washington, uh, Jackie Robinson was lobbying very hard for Kenny Washington. And uh, just a couple of weeks, at, three weeks after he signed, he said, Kenny is, Kenny's going to play ball. Kenny's going to play baseball. And uh, Wendell Smith, the legendary sports editor of the uh, Pittsburgh Courier, uh, sent Branch Rickey a letter. And he was a close confidant of Branch Rickey's. And in his letter, he reminded uh, Mr. Rickey of his pledge to sign a second black player. And in his letter, he said, I am suggesting very seriously that you consider Kenny Washington. I understand that he is much better than Robinson. Why didn't it happen? Well, it was this last week of January before the Dodgers contacted Jackie Robinson, or Kenny Washington, I apologize. And Kenny stated publicly, I answered no because I had other plans. He did not elaborate at that time what the other plans were. What the other plans were was two weeks earlier the Los Angeles Rams had declared they were moving from Cleveland, or the Rams had declared they were moving from Cleveland to Los Angeles. And when their general manager, Chili Walsh, came out, uh, he was ambushed. He went to a meeting of the Los Angeles Coliseum Commission to try and arrange a lease. And uh, Hallie Harding was the man who was uh, a writer with, I believe, the Los Angeles Sentinel. And on behalf of the, the three black newspapers in Los Angeles, he gave an impassioned speech urging the Coliseum which was built with taxpayer dollars. And point, and he pointed out that African-Americans in Los Angeles were among those taxpayers. And uh, Harding pressed the Coliseum Commission not to give a lease to an organization that was 
to a team that was part of an organization that refused to allow blacks to participate. And it became somewhat contentious. And Chile, Chile Walsh, the general manager, said that they would give Kenny Washington an opportunity. Now, the next day, he caught a train back to Cleveland to close up the offices. He had hired a PR director, and he directed that man to get a deal done with Kenny Washington. And uh, over Kenny Washington's kitchen table, they struck a verbal agreement. And as Kenny Washington uh, he had secretly agreed to the, to the deal with the Rams, the signing was not officially announced until March when Walsh and the rest of the Rams executives and coaches arrived in Los Angeles. But it was the very first press conference they held the morning after their arrival in Los Angeles, announcing the signing of Kenny Washington. And uh, Washington said about the Dodgers situation, he'd given the Rams his word, quote, I could not go back on it. Johnny Wright ended up being that second player and uh, joined Jackie Robinson for part of the 46th season uh, in Montreal. Kenny then went on to focus on his professional football career, but all the while baseball remained in the picture. Late in his very first NFL season in uh, November of 1946, headlines came out that uh, he very likely was going to sign with the Brooklyn Dodgers. And they came from Leo DeRocher. DeRocher was in Los Angeles after uh, the baseball season and uh, was to be on the uh, Milton Berle show or the Jack Benny show. I take it back to the Jack Benny show. And they had a cast party at the Brown Derby and a writer for the Los Angeles Herald, John B. Old, uh, slipped into the restaurant to try and get some time with DeRocher. He wanted to talk with him about Jackie Robinson, but DeRocher wanted to talk about Kenny Washington. And DeRocher told him that he felt it was very imminent that the Dodgers were going to sign Kenny Washington. And headlines and articles to that effect uh, appeared in newspapers all around the country for several weeks uh, after that. And as spring training approached and nothing happened, uh, a writer uh, cornered DeRocher to find out what was going on. And DeRocher said, the Dodgers were not going to sign him, and his quote was, his knee was on the bum. And the background on that was, in Kenny Washington's last game for the Hollywood Bears, uh, the Pacific Coast Football League, he suffered a very severe injury to his left knee. He signed with the Rams in March, and in April, he had surgery to both knees. And he was very ineffective his entire first season in the NFL. Uh, and that is what the Dodgers saw, and they were convinced that he was done. So they elected not to sign him as a result of that. Now, in Kenny Washington, to his credit, he did a remarkable job, as, as you read in the book, uh, rehabbing that knee uh, following the 46 season. Absolutely incredible what he did. And in 1947, when he came back, while he was not the UCLA or the Hollywood Bears, Kenny Washington, he was pretty close. And for about three-fourths of the way through the season, he was second in the NFL in rushing before uh, he was... I'll say maimed in a pile by Chicago Cardinals players who were twisting his legs to try and injure him. And they did injure his knee. And he played very little the rem remainder of the season. Washington retired at the end of his third season uh, with the Rams in December of 1948. And he was very quickly uh, approached about playing baseball. Bing Crosby <coughs> approached him and offered him the opportunity. Crosby was a part owner of the Pittsburgh Pirates. And Bing Crosby offered him the opportunity to join the Pirates. The San Diego Padres of the Pacific Coast League also offered him a contract. The year prior, in 1948, they had signed John Ritchie here on the right and integrated the Pacific Coast League. The 1949 team would include Minnie Minoso and Luke Easter. Uh, but Kenny had made commitments to appear in three movies, and he told both uh, Crosby and the Padres that he couldn't play in, in 1949 because of his acting commitments. He uh, starred opposite Kurt Lancaster in Rope of Sand. Uh, he played a doctor in a very controversial and award-winning film called Pinky. Uh, Gene Crane and Ethel Barrymore were the stars of the film. They were both nominated for Academy Awards. Daryl F. Zanuck uh, made this a pet project of his, and he personally cast Kenny for the role of a doctor uh, in this film. And uh, I've got a copy of it. It's a fascinating, it's, I think it's a terrific movie. Um, and, uh, and one where Kenny has, has a really good part in it. And then the third film he did that year was the Jackie Robinson story. And he had a very small, very quick speaking part in the film. And it was kind of funny and it shows you the, the good relationship between Jackie and Kenny, because uh, prior to the start of, of filming, somebody, a reporter asked Jackie, who was playing himself, uh, 
what he thought about acting. And Jackie said, oh, heck, if Kenny can do it, anybody can do it. And they, they, were, they were really good friends. And uh, uh, as, as people have said, uh, once Jackie moved to New York, those UCLA friendships kind of uh, waned a little bit. But when Kenny would be in New York playing with the Rams, they would get together. Sometimes it would be uh, during media interviews and sometimes over dinner. But Kenny, as soon as he finished his movie commitments, made the declaration that he was going to play baseball. He spent several months in a park, uh, not far from his house, not far from the LA Coliseum, uh, daily taking batting practice and training. He dropped a, a bit of weight and uh, felt that he was in really, really good shape to play baseball. Leo DeRocher lived in Santa Monica in the off season. And uh, Tom Harmon had been in some celebrity games with Kenny. And Tom Harmon was at a, at a party at DeRocher's home and approached him and said, I think Kenny's ready. I think you got to look at him. And the New York Giants signed Kenny Washington prior to spring training in 1950. It was a big story in a lot of circles in, in, in the United States. Uh, one of the biggest name players in professional football, uh, potentially making the shift into professional baseball. But for Kenny Washington, he had a lot of obstacles. He was 31 years old at that time. He was the oldest rookie in any of the spring training camps, American or national. And he had had five knee surgeries. So he was not the Kenny Washington of 10, 12 years earlier. And he had not played competitive baseball at this point in five years. He spent a couple of two and a half years in the war serving in the LA police department. And uh, his draft number was low because he had a young family and he wanted to serve. So he joined the LAPD and they put a, a, a police force, police department team together of which he was the star and traveled all throughout California. But he had, he had not played with the police department in five years, not played any competitive ball during that time. The Giants that, that spring, they, they trained in Phoenix. And Leo DeRocher declared before spring training that seven of his eight position starters were set. The only competition there would be for a job would be the starting right field job. He had eight players competing for seven outfield spots. The Giants were going to break camp with seven outfielders. Kenny would battle Monty Irvin and Don Mueller for the right field job. In the Giants' very first inter-squad game, Washington hit a tape measure home run, and DeRocher really raved about his play. When they opened exhibition play uh, in Tucson against Cleveland, the Giants had Kenny Washington as their starting right fielder. Their starting outfield was Monty Irvin in center, Hank Thompson in left, and Kenny Washington in right. In that game, the Giants and Cleveland started seven black players, and that got national notoriety. And uh, columnists were raising the question of whether it was the most ever in, in a big league game. After that series, Kenny was assigned to the B team. Uh, the Giants split their, their, their squad up. They wanted Kenny to get at bats. And they saw very quickly that he was rusty and struggled hitting the curveball. Most of the B team's uh, games were against Pacific Coast League teams there in Arizona. Late in spring training, the last week, they divided the two teams up. The A team went to Central and, uh, and the San Francisco Bay Area with the Pittsburgh Pirates for four or five games. The B team went to Southern California for games with the St. Louis, with the St. Louis Browns, uh, the PCL Seattle Rainiers. They went down to Oceanside and played the U.S. Marines, and then they played uh, the University of Southern California. DeRocher and Horace Stoneham accompanied the B team because that's where the last few spots were going to come from. And they wanted to get a good look at players on that B team. Kenny Washington in the USC game had his biggest game of, of the spring. He hit a grand slam and a two-run triple, finished with six RBIs in a, in a big, big Giants win. But the very next day, Leo DeRocher pulled him aside and broke the news to him that he was not going to be breaking camp with the Giants. DeRocher said, make no mistake about it. Kenny could really wrap that ball. Nobody has worked any harder in camp than Kenny. I was disappointed in his throwing. Football must have tightened up his arm and shoulder muscles. The Giants wanted to place him at Jersey City with their farm <coughs> team there. Kenny declined, and, and, and he told DeRocher and Stoneham that if he was going to play minor league ball, he wanted to be on the West Coast. So DeRocher uh, spoke to friends with Pacific Coast League teams. And the Los Angeles Angels, the night before opening day, signed Kenny Washington to a contract. Kenny joined the Angels uh, initially. Uh, his first four or five uh, appearances were as a pinch hitter. Uh, he was hitless, but he hit some. He made some noise. He had some tape measure home runs that hooked foul. Uh, 
but the curveball again was a nemesis and guys that played with him at UCLA and friends that watched him with the angels said that it was clearly rushed that at UCLA, he had never had trouble with the curveball and that he just needed the at bats, uh, late in the month of April, uh, the uh, Bill Kelly, the angels manager was unhappy with the play of their third baseman. They made changes and they made Kenny the third baseman and he, uh, started two games, but in his second game, he was badly spiked on a, on a stolen base attempt and he was going to miss time. And the angels approached him uh, with a suggestion that uh, when he was healthy again and able to return to the lineup, they sent him to one of their farm clubs at a much lower level just to get him playing and get him back in that rhythm and, and routine. And, and Kenny had in his mind and he had talked to the angels about this and, and felt like if he wasn't contributing after a month, then that was probably a sign that his time had passed. So he told the Angels that he felt it was best for him to retire from professional sports, and he did. He moved uh, into a business career in the wholesale liquor uh, industry, was a business executive. In 1956, he was inducted into the National Football Foundation Hall of Fame. And Walter O'Malley, when the Dodgers came west uh, for 1958, recruited Washington as an advisor, and he helped out both the, uh, the, the sales department and also the scouting department. He kind of was, uh, was a bird dog. And, and uh, one of the things I came across in my research was he's, he really deserves the credit for the Dodgers signing in 1964, Willie Crawford, who that year was the most uh, uh, sought after amateur player in the country. The Dodgers got him. Uh, Tommy Lasorda has long received credit, but the family was quoted in some of the black newspapers as saying that it was the relationship that Kenny Washington built with the family that laid the foundation for the Dodgers to get him. And uh, Kenny played a, a big role of that. He, he hosted the family several times in the stadium club at Dodger Stadium, and then kind of turned things over to Lasorda and Kenny Myers, the area supervisor, and they were able to, to successfully land uh, Willie Crawford. Kenny Washington died in 1971 of an incurable uh, and very rare uh, heart and lung disease. And this plaque in his memory is in the Los Angeles Coliseum. And as you see at the bottom, it reads, an All-American for All-America. Kenny was a remarkable athlete, a remarkable person. And I think one of the things I take away from this project is, I think it's a tragedy that he's been forgotten. Uh, he's really one of the greats uh, to ever play the game of football and a tremendous, tremendous baseball player as well. Uh, for you, Jackie Robinson kind of uh, hit the nail on the head. He was speaking uh, to an NAACP convention. And Jackie Robinson said, when you talk about the great players of all time and you forget Kenny Washington, you're forgetting the greatest. That wraps me up. But before I turn it back over to Gary and we get into questions and answers, as I did with the Hollywood Stars book, I want to make a special offer to any of you that might be interested in getting this book a 30% discount, which will bring the total price to $30. Uh, and uh, if you want to take advantage of it and get a signed copy, you can uh, purchase it either through PayPal or with a check. Make note of my email, dtsport at comcast.net, and that'll get you to my PayPal account or email me uh, with your address and I'll email you my address. You can mail a check to, and uh, I appreciate you guys. Uh, being a part of this today, and I will turn it back over to Gary, and we'll get on to talking and asking, answering your questions. Dan, that was fabulous, Dan. Thank you so much. And uh, pardon the pun, thanks for tailoring it to baseball a little more than you <laughs> normally would. Um, before we uh, turn it over, I got a couple of things to say to you. Um, since you really didn't go too much into the football aspect, and we know from the Jackie Robinson movies uh, how he was treated being a black man, uh, what were the repercussions that Kenny Washington went through in football? Well, uh, I'll give you a little bit of a long answer on that, Gary. Um, think about what Jackie Robinson went through and then multiply it. Um, multiply that when you consider it was a contact sport. Uh, the things that, that happened to him in piles were horrific. Uh, college football, the uh, University of Missouri came out to play uh, UCLA in his uh, sophomore year, and the Missouri players were scooping up the line chalk and were trying to rub it into his eyes when they tackled mm -hmm. 
uh, game with SMU. It was the first time any of the SMU players had been on the same field with an African-American opponent. And uh, the team doctor at halftime spent all of halftime trying to stitch up and, and uh, repair Kenny's face. Uh, things that happened to him were, were horrific. Jackie Robinson told an interesting no, he was story. Trying out for the Giants in New York. After uh, after his uh, uh, after Jackie's season at Montreal, he came back to Pasadena, and uh, he was speaking at a banquet. And a reporter asked him about how he was treated, and he said that the very first Montreal road trip went to Baltimore, which was of course below the Mason Dixon line. And Jackie and Rachel had only been married for two months. So Rachel accompanied him on the road trip. And Jackie told uh, of this horrific abuse th that he had received uh, throughout that ball, the first game of the series there in Baltimore. And that night in their hotel room, Rachel broke down sobbing and pleaded with Jackie to quit baseball and return to California and take up another line of work. And Jackie looked her in the eye and said, honey, this is nothing compared to what we went through playing football at UCLA. Thanks, Dan. Uh, by the way, um, I might have been the only person to hear uh, what you claimed was you bet your life with Groucho Marx. That was actually Professor Wagstaff promoting the fact that Kenny did not attend Fredonia. I'll let that be uh, <laughs> for any of you horse feather, horse feather fans for the Marx Brothers movie. And I think Dan knows what I'm talking about. Sure, so, sure, sure. <laughs> Kirk, would you like to uh, chime in and talk a little? You're muted, Kirk. There you go. <laughs> yeah, I um, actually, uh, I'm really uh, impressed with all of this. This is a lot of stuff that I was not privy to growing up. So this is actually really, uh, really great uh, information. Uh, Dan did a phenomenal job in his research and 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 writing the book. I. I actually just started reading it um, and it's so far, it's quite compelling. And I, I, I'm really enjoying it because I, you know, I'm as old as grandchild. And I, when he passed away, I was only like seven years old. So, uh, you know, I, 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 you know, the only stories that I usually used to hear was from my own dad, uh, but uh, not nothing like this. This is, this has been really something. So uh, to get, have this gathering and everything, this has been great. Thank you. Thank you, Dan, for, for, for doing this. And uh, thank and, you, Kirk, you know, for your help. And, and, and I want to yeah. boast about you and your family a little bit. You know, Kirk played pro ball in the Cubs organization, heck of a college pitcher uh, in the uh, College World Series, D2 or D3 at, at Pomona? Division two. There you go. His dad, uh, Kenny Jr., uh, played at USC, was uh, all nine uh, in his last year in the College World Series and played several seasons Kenny Jr. played several seasons in the Dodgers organization, got to AAA, and then went over and played part of a season in Japan. So uh, great baseball family as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and definitely my uh, my brother also, you know, he played one year at USC and then he went to, uh, and then he played in the Cubs organization as well. So I uh, got to AA, I believe. Uh, injuries kind of derailed him a little bit, but um, he was actually more, of an athlete than I was. So, uh, <laughs> but he was, he was fantastic. Yeah. That's great. Well, I appreciate yeah. your help. Thank you very much, Kirk. Kirk, I appreciate thank, it. Kirk thanks for joining us. And um, usually what we do here is I record this and then I send it out in a day or two. So Dan will forward this to you. So you'll have a keepsake of the evening. Wonderful. That's great. I really appreciate it. I was hoping that was going to happen because there was some great stuff in there. Wonderful. Bill Clank, you're up. I want to yield the floor temporarily to uh, Steve. I know he has a five o'clock getaway. Uh, that's, Steve. Um, that's not anybody. Steve. That's uh, Cha Cha, I think, Raw Child tonight. Where's your hat? Steve, go ahead. Thank you, Bill. Um, what, Kenny, what year did Kenny Washington pass away? That's the first part. The 1971. Part, what year? 71. Oh, he was, he was still very young, 71. Yes. Yeah. Um, I don't know. You think you know everything. I have so many photos and stuff, pictures you have. I, I never even knew that he was involved with the Giants. I know it was Artie Wilson, Willie, Monty Irvin, Henry Thompson, maybe one or two others. Ray Dandridge. I can't wait to read your book because Great. never knew he was involved. Rich Rogers, yeah, I, I, that was one of the that, many things that, that surprised me. Giants? Pardon? Rich, Rich Rogers was on those. Who knows everything? Did you know he was involved? <laughs> no, not with the true. No, I had no idea that Kenny Washington I, was with Giants. 
those photos are just those priceless. Photos are great. Yeah, they really fucking yeah. Thank you. Really, really a, rare. a little a little story on the photos. And uh, when I worked on the Hollywood book, it's kind of a fun story. When I worked on the Hollywood book, I got connected with a collector in Los Angeles, and I don't know if I should out him, but he's a judge, and he has three storage lockers full of Hollywood stars memorabilia programs, uniforms, you, you name it. And so I was visiting with him and he said, well, what are you working on next? And I said, Kenny Washington. He was ecstatic because he's a UCLA alum and he also is a big memorabilia collector of UCLA football. He has every single program from every UCLA game in history, including the 38 Pineapple Bowl in Hawaii. And it's incredible. And, and he had these pictures. And I was just, I couldn't believe it. And he had these, you know, when I saw the, the picture of the Grand Slam swing uh, with the Giants, I, I was just blown away. And I said, I've got to use that for the book. So he, he's just, we become, he's become a great friend and he's been a great help to these projects. All right. We're going to go to Bill and then Lee uh, Lowen. Bill, go ahead. Thank you, Gary and Dan. Thank you for some kind communications about the book, which I got on an early out here. Uh, I will tell you, I've read, I read the Genevieve's book and I certainly read the, uh, the Hollywood stars book, uh, Lights, uh, Camera, Fastball. This dwarfs them. Oh, thank you. Uh, but then don't take that from me. I'm a big college football fan, bigger <laughs> than I am a giant fan technically. But uh, uh, in that sense, I wanted to, if I could, you, it's, I want to say, first off, the way you, on this presentation, interweave baseball uh, into that book, which is not largely about baseball, but you brought out everything about baseball that could be brought out and uh, uh, more than uh, is in the book, obviously, you, you brought out. I did have two questions, though, that relate to uh, football and actually you know, picking up on, you know, the discrimination element here. Uh, well, the, the first one is, uh, he was quite a shot putter. You, you didn't mention that, but you did in the book. And I was thinking, you know, he, he had tremendous uh, strength and he certainly, uh, I think he, he may have led the Pacific Coast uh, Conference in, you know, uh, in their championships and in, in, in the shot put. Uh, long and short of that, do you think that that strength that he developed with the shot put could have led to his ability to throw 72 to 80 yard passes? You know, we talked about it early in the book about, uh, you know, he just loved to throw, throw things and he would throw rubber balls against the wall as a kid. And the feeling was that that's kind of how he developed his arm strength, which is throwing constantly throwing, uh, you know, rubber balls against a wall as, as a youth. You know, he only competed, well, he competed one year in track and field in high school, and then his freshman year, because they couldn't field a baseball team at UCLA, he joined the track team, and he set the freshman record in the shot put. Uh, I think my wife posted a message here about where you can find that uh, You Bet Your Life episode with Kenny, and I'm telling you, you got to watch it. It is hysterical. Because the woman with him was the U.S. champion in the shot put. And Groucho gets going back and forth between the two of them with their PRs, their best marks. And he's really ripping on Kenny, uh, you know, because she's got the bigger mark. And I don't want to spoil it, but it's very, very funny. Um, and, and anyway, so he had the freshman record. Now, his buddy, Woody Strode, this is an amazing athlete. He was the stud shot putter at the varsity level. Hmm. And... Just as I think what, what we've all maybe forgotten is the greatness of Jackie Robinson, professional in three sports, basketball, football, baseball, and a guy who he would have won the gold medal. He was the favorite to win the gold medal in the 1940 Olympics. Tell me one athlete who was that great in four different disciplines like that. But Woody Strode could have been the decathlete in the 1940 Olympics. They were beginning to prepare him for that. So he was a remarkable, I think he was the, you know, the shot put and the discus were his main events in track and field. Uh, so he was the, the much better weight man than Kenny, but it is kind of odd to think of a, a halfback slash quarterback being a shot put, uh, you know, you would never find that today, but yeah, it, it could have been, it could have worked to improve his, his arm strength. But one of the things that his coach Bill Spalding talked about in an interview with Grantland Rice was how Kenny could fling the ball 
70 yards with just a flick of the wrist. He wasn't winding up like other guys. It was just kind of a, a wrist flick, and he could he could shoot it out there that long. By, know, the, way, by the way, Dan, uh, that clip is available on YouTube. Great. His uh, number 13 was retired uh, by uh, uh, UCLA. And I got a question for you. This, this guy integrates the NFL, and they don't retire his number, but but they do retire Marion Motley and Bill Willis, who had uh, integrated uh, the All-American uh, Football Conference, you know, the equivalency of the NFL. I, I, I just can't believe they've never ret uh, retired the number and they, they haven't put him, you know, simply based on what he did in those three years. I know it's that short career deal. Right. But gee, right. couldn't you let him in the door at the NFL Hall of Fame? They, they've put some marginal guys in there just like baseball. Has. I'm sorry I got off on football, but yeah, that's <laughs> largely what this book's about, Dan. And I had to. Well, yeah. Uh, and, and Bill, uh, two, two responses to you. I think, I think the Rams have been very remiss in not honoring. I do think that number 13 needs to be retired by the Rams. Yeah. Um, in the NFL situation, you know, I've, I've thought about this a lot. It, should he be in the Hall of Fame? And it's not the NFL Hall of Fame, remember. It is the Professional Football Hall of Fame. So now how do you look at these other leagues? At that time when he played for the Hollywood Bears, there were five other leagues below the NFL. Now the quality of the Pacific Coast Football League was really good. I mean, when the All-American Football Conference started up in 46, a lot of the top players out of the Pacific Coast Professional Football League went into the AAFC. Yeah. And there were a lot of guys that just, they didn't want to go back to the Midwest and the East to play. They'd grown up on the West Coast, played college ball on the West Coast. And so they preferred playing in the, in the uh, Pacific Coast Professional Football League. Uh, the, the, so, I, you know, my thought is, if this really is the Pro Football Hall of Fame, then let's take a look at Kenny Washington's body of professional work, his four seasons with the Hollywood Bears, in addition to his three seasons with the Rams. And he was far and away the, the greatest player in, in the Pacific Coast League. Let's take a look at that and evaluate him that way. One final thing, Dan's description in the first chapter. Uh, Dan, it's a great book, but the first chapter was so unbelievable. Dan's first chapter, he describes his first game playing for UCLA against Oregon. And I will tell you, go read that chapter. You think you're in the stands watching the game. That that was that's the best chapter in the book, Dan. It Thank just you. happened to be the first. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. I appreciate the kind words. You're great, Dan. Dan maybe uh, this book might enlighten people. In I the do NFL, hope so. And you know, maybe you'll be the uh, reason that this happens. Well, I know Kirk and a lot of the family members have been trying for a long time to enlighten people, and I just hope I can support their effort. All right, we're going to go to Lee Lowenfish and then Ed Freer. Lee, go ahead. Dan, uh, you, in the 1939 uh, Bruins had five blacks on the team, is that right? That is correct. Now, when did the, it, it, that was the record until the 60s, is, is that fair to say? It is, it is, Lee. There were only 12 college programs that were integrated at that time and, and the other 11 you know just had pretty much one player uh ucla uh had integrated in 33 and then kenny and woody strode joined the varsity in 37 and then in 39 jackie robinson and ray bartlett transferred in from pasadena city college and johnny Wynn, a fullback slash linebacker came up from the junior varsity uh where he had played in 38 You'll find a lot of articles that only say four. And I found one that said, oh, when uh, quit the team in preseason. That was not true. The coaches got their players really good jobs. Johnny Wynn's job was as a porter on the train from L.A. to Chicago and back. So at the time that preseason practice started, three or four days into preseason practice, Johnny Wynn had to go make his last run that he was committed to make. <laughs> So that I'm assuming that that's where people got the idea that he quit because in some of the papers, it said Johnny Wynn left the team. But if you go through the game stories throughout the season, week to week, he is in there and he makes the game saving goal line tackle in week nine against Oregon state that sets the stage for the final game of the season with USC, the two undefeated teams, the Rose bowl and the whole controversy with the university of Tennessee and everything that goes into that. 
Now, now, as far as his movie career is concerned, he got off to a great start. I mean, did he lose interest or did they lose interest in him? You know, it's a good question, Lee, and I don't know the answer to that. I, I was very curious about it, but wasn't really able to find an answer to that. Um, because certainly it, it began, as you, as you, you know, point out, very, very well. And, and it was a symbol of how popular he was in Southern California. Uh, but the roles that came to him later, there were other movies prior to those 49 roles. Um, and he had some he had some really good roles and, and uh, in some very good films. Uh, you and I have you know, touched on it through emails over the past couple of years. So and, I know, don't know why it diminished. And Pinky was the same year as uh, Sidney Poche playing the doctor opposite the racist Richard Widmark. And I know I think it's No Way Out. No Way Out. An amazing yeah. film. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So many, so many uh, opportunities missed. You know? Well, what made what made Pinky controversial? It was it was reputed to be the very first interracial love scene in in a movie, uh, and there was a lot of controversy in the African American community because they hired Gene Crane, who was white, to play a light skinned black, yeah. and there was a lot of outrage saying, "Why didn't you hire Lena Horne?" Uh, but there's a lot more to that, and I'll leave that for another day. Thanks, Lee. Ed Freer, you're up. Yes, this is just a remarkable presentation that I've, I've learned a lot from. Thank you, Ed. Thank and, you. Yeah, and, and my kudos to that Los Angeles committee, uh, city, you don't hear enough kudos for the civic committees for standing up for uh, Mr. Washington. Now, I have two questions. As we all know the Jackie Robinson story, have you, why isn't this story out there public? And have, have, have you got a reason why it hasn't been? Well, I've, nobody, has, nobody has said categorically why, but as I've tried to study it, two things come to mind. Uh, one, when you go back and you look at Jackie signing versus Kenny signing, baseball was the national pastime at that time. And Jackie signing was bold headlines in almost every newspaper in America. Professional football was really low on the interest list in 1945-46, maybe seventh or eighth on the interest list. And you go through newspapers all across the country, and Kenny's signing was just a small little, maybe two-sentence article at most around the country. And in some cases, it was one line in a list of sports notes. Uh, so I think that has something to do with it. The other part of it that I wonder about is there were Blacks in the NFL up through the 1933 season. Joe Lillard was the last when he was cut by the Cardinals. But Paul Robeson and others uh, had played in the late 20s, early 30s. And, and so I'm sure there's a dilemma. I'm just assuming there's a dilemma within the NFL about how do we not disrespect Paul Robeson and others who played in the earlier years if we focus all of our recognition on Kenny? Now, what Kenny did was tremendous and miraculous. I mean, the things he went through were horrific. Uh, he deserves much more recognition than he's received. Uh, but I, you know, I, I've tried to play devil's advocate and wonder what people are thinking. And, and those are the two things that come to mind. Right. So there's basically that time lapse, maybe. The problem. Yeah, 12, yeah, there were 12 years yeah. where there was just an yes. unwritten wink, wink rule. Still, uh, some, somebody should be made aware of it. And yeah. just a Another, and maybe you can build it up, just one other minor point. They it talked about the horrible, horrible treatment of Jackie Robinson in Baltimore. What were the Dodgers doing in Baltimore? He was playing for Montreal. 1946, oh, he was... played for the Dodgers farm team at Montreal. Oh. And so they're in the International League, and their first road trip was down to Baltimore. My confusion, that explains that. I have a habit Thank of doing you. that to people, so don't feel bad. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Dan, I meant to ask you. Um, when Leo DeRocha was the manager of the Dodgers, he wanted to sign him. Uh, you know, when he went over to the Giants, was this, you know, another piece of uh, DeRocha remembering what a, what a yes. fabulous it was? Yeah, DeRocha was a fan. DeRocha went to UCLA games. He was very much aware of Kenny. And when, when Kenny played at UCLA, he was, he was very well scouted uh, when he played at UCLA. There were guys on his team, Bill Gray, if you remember the Hollywood Stars book, the big first baseman for Hollywood prior to the war, who was the only guy to hit a home run over the scoreboard in Gilmore Field. He was the first baseman on that team. And the UCLA head coach, uh, Marty Krug, was also a scout for the Detroit Tigers. So the UCLA players were very well scouted, and, and DeRocher knew him very well. 
Yeah. Also, also, uh, you know, again, you you in quotes tailored this for us, but you know, <laughs> I I watch the NFL Network and they have you know a football life. I, I don't understand why this would not. I think it would be really great well. for it. I do. I think it would be great for it. I've heard some rumblings of, of things possibly in the works. Uh, a PR guy that's done some work for me, a good friend of mine, has spoken with the NFL Network about having me come on Good Morning Football. So I may come crash on your couch, Gary, if that you comes to fruition. Than, you are more than welcome, <laughs> and please let us know when this happens. You got it. You deserve it. Uh, Renee, it. go ahead, sir. Great presentation. I, I mean, thanks, Renee. This is another good reason why to join this this organization. I mean, the, the stuff you find out, the stuff, like Steve mentioned, and, and you know, just when you think you know, you don't know. Uh, <laughs> with that in mind, I'm a big TCM guy. Turner Classic Movies, watched them. Even when it, 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 there's a movie I may not be interested in, it's on. With that being said, and the movies that you've mentioned, I have seen. But the first movie that you indicated, which was that, that football movie, is that another outlet to, to investigate TCM, to ask them, hey, here's a poster. Does this movie exist? And do you know where? And they might be a great stuff. resource, Renee. I mean, I, Lee and I, Lee and I, half of our emails are about, uh, you know, film noir and, and TCM. Love, as opposed love, to baseball. love noir films. Yeah. Right. Um, but, uh, you know, I think that's a great idea to reach out to TCM and see what resources they have to find out. I, through the Hollywood Stars book, I got to know people at the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences at their mm -hmm. library and their museum. And, you know, they've got no, no uh, resource, no reference of it other than the poster. Um, so, yeah, and, and I know uh, Kirk's aunt and I spoke about it and she said that the family's been trying to find it for a number of years. And, yeah, it's... I mean, I mean who knows? There could be a fine, almost as, uh, as a fine as... Uh, uh... Uh, uh, what was it? Game six of the Yankees. Uh, uh, Bing Crosby. Uh, Bing Crosby. Yeah. There it yeah. was. It's yeah. out. Wouldn't that so, be something? I mean, that might be something. I mean, that's worth investigating. Uh, thank you again. Great presentation. Oh, thank Loved you, Renee. It. And I'm going to get the book. It. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else have a question for Dan? Yes. Uh, I was wondering what if. Arthur, if, how are you? Go ahead, Arthur. Uh, if anything, what was the connection with the New York football giants? Or was that just. Uh, oh, no, no, no. I mean, he played against them. And in fact, uh, after a game against the Giants at the Polo Grounds is when he, in 48, um, told a sports writer that, that he was going to retire at the end of the season. But no, I just was making, a, uh, just having some fun saying, you know, here's a, here's a football book. This is not about football. I'm, I'm not crazy. Bear with me and we'll, we'll get into the meat of it. So yeah, no connection to the football Giants. Good. Thank you, Dan. You bet. Big Andy, you're up. Unmute, Andy. Unmute. Okay. There you go. <laughs> Dan, fantastic presentation. Thank you very I'll be much. Up all Andy. night with the links. <laughs> but, you know, thinking of all that goes together. But first of all, Pants Rowland, is that the same guy? 1917 White Sox, right? That's right. That's okay. right. That's so it's the same guy. And yep. how about <laughs> Walsh? He coached the Rams to the title in 45. The, you That's had a right. different That's name, right. Adam Walsh? Well, Adam was the brother of the general manager. Oh, all right. And then uh, ownership because they had a poor year. And, and, and this was a difficulty for Kenny. If I could kind of go down this, this road on football for a little bit. Kenny had always played in the single wing offense where the backs can take the direct snap from center. And so he had a run pass option. But when he got to the Rams, they were playing the, the, the T formation. And the Rams didn't know what to do with him because the quarterback took the snap up in, under center and then turned and handed off or, or set up to pass. And, and so they didn't know what to do with him. And they initially made him a quarterback. And he actually started ahead of Waterfield in a couple of exhibition games. And his first play in the National Football League on opening day against the Eagles, he came in when Waterfield got hurt. And his first play was an 18 yard pass completion. Oh, and then ultimately they moved him to fullback, but this, but they had lost so many guys that didn't want to come West from Cleveland and ended up staying back and signing with the Browns and playing in the all America conference. So the team had a terrible year in 46. They fired Walsh as the coach, the brother general manager got pissed off because the owner did it and not him. And he quit. 
So yeah, it was just it was crazy. So those were the Walters. They, they, that, they uh, had some great teams. I just want to add oh. one thing more important. Now Kenny made the College Football Hall of Fame. He did. Okay. Now I happened to be there. It was one of the best things I saw. It took them till 1995 to put Jim Brown in, who of course sort of was robbed of the Heisman, but it took them about 70 years to put Paul Ropes in it. But Jim said, hey, they kept me out a long time, but they made a mistake. They put me in with my hero, Paul Ropes, in, and it was very emotional that day. And That's it was great. great. It was great, great to see. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. Thanks, Andy. I appreciate it very much. Anybody else have a comment or question? All right, Dan, um, again, what is the best way to uh, get your book other than Amazon? Yeah, you got Amazon, you got Barnes and Noble, the publisher is Roman and Littlefield Roman with a W and uh, you can purchase direct from them or come through me just for this, this group, new guys, 30% discount, uh, $30 price and I will sign it and uh, just hit my email dtsport at comcast.net. So Dan, when this is over later on uh, tomorrow morning, I am going to freeze frame that shot you made of your email and the cost. And this way it'll be nice and easy. I'll send that out with a thank you to everybody who uh, was here and anybody who will view it. How does that sound? Sounds good to me, thanks. All right, Lee, you got a question, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, can you tell us a little bit about the title, Walking Alone? My my first thought was Rogers and Hammerstein people <laughs> might, might, might get on, on your case, but 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 um, what does it come from? Uh, you know, I had a great conversation with the editor I worked with at Roman and Littlefield, and we were, we were bouncing a lot of things back and forth, and uh, they didn't like my original title. I can't even remember what it was. That's how memorable it was. And uh, and she gave me some some things to think about. And as I was going through it, there was really something Kenny said uh, in the book. Uh, that where we talked about the long walks he would take Jackie Robinson on and, and the advice he would give him. And it, so it wasn't from that line specifically, but as I thought of those two words that were part of, of that line he gave to Jackie Robinson, I thought, you know, that's a lot of his life, walking alone. And uh, I, that's why I kind of thought about it. You know, obviously his first year with the Rams, Woody Strode was there, but after that, you know, he was, he was on his own. Um, with Hollywood, uh, a bit of the time at Hollywood, he was the only African American player on the team, and that's that's kind of where it came from. You know, Dan, I got to tell you, I, I'm a huge football fan, huge baseball fan, and, and hockey also. And you know, there are Jackie Robinson. I always remember they talked about Willie O'Ree being the first African American hockey player. But I'd never heard about Kenny Washington until you spoke to me, you know, last year saying, hey, I got this book out. You know, would you consider having me on again? I'll tie it into baseball. And I, of course, said yes, even if you didn't tie it into baseball. But <laughs> really, this is an amazing story that really has to get out there, especially in your football fans. I mean, the New York Giant fans who are in here are, you know, I think we're all like, wow, when did this happen? But really fabulous. I appreciate it. And I do think it's a, it's a human tragedy. I think it's really wrong that football has not uh, held him up and celebrated him. And, and I do hope that this can be an additional piece of the effort to, to change that. All right, guys, let's, uh, Renee, go ahead. I'm sorry. You, you, you just said it right there. I was just about to ask you that question. I mean, we, we know about Jack Robinson. We know that what he went through. I mean, the last movie they did 42, I mean, really exploited, uh, 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 what he went through to, to, to hear that, what he went through for football, playing the game. That's, and, and, and I can't remember, I can't quote you, but you did say something about the different that, that Jackie said, the difference between what he went through in baseball as pales in comparison to football, that in itself, that in itself should explain, uh, would love to hear uh, and, 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 really commemorate his efforts playing the game what he absolutely. went through absolutely i mean no, it's a I shame and you know what i hate to say this uh, uh, uh um uh, ask you this but uh, uh i'm in that age uh, range <laughs> with stuff but uh audiobooks yes. you know i've spoken to roman and littlefield and they have a contract 
with a production house that okay. looks at their titles and makes those decisions. Okay. And to date, they 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 claim this is what the editor I work with tells me that this production house says that sports audio books don't sell, so they okay. have stayed away from it. Now, you know, maybe people can email Roman to Littlefield. No, I don't know because no, I I've got a lot of friends telling me, hey, you know, I'm. I'm driving a lot at work. You know, I'm in a, I'm in a right. farming area here in Central California. So guys are in their pickups all day and they're like, man, I wish I had an audio book. I can listen to it while I'm driving my 2000 acres or whatever. And yeah, so I've got a buddy with a coffee farm over on the big island and he's like, man, I wish I could get an audio book and listen while I'm working. So, um, yeah, and, I, 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 and I've told him, you know, I mean, I've told him I've got a production set up here at the house. I can read it myself, but, you know, they've got a contract and they follow what the production company wants to do. Well, thought I'd ask, and uh, thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Love thanks. It. Thanks Dan, again. Dan, the, uh, the Baseball Hall of Fame, of course, has this uh, bookstore and, and merchandise stuff. Have you thought about reaching out to Ken and having the book there? I, I think you'd make I was, it. Well, I was just there uh, four, three, three weeks ago doing a presentation on Lights, Camera, Fastball, and did a book signing there at the bookstore and a talk in the theater. And yeah, I'll reach out to them and let them know. I know that they deal with Roman and Littlefield sales reps as well. So uh, no, I'm, I'm not, I'm not talking about Cooperstown. I'm talking about Kenny. Oh, the pro football. Yes. Ah, you know, um, uh, Kenny's daughter, Karen, uh, told me that I guess she goes to Canton uh, for hall of fame induction and that she was going to take the book back there with her. So uh, I'll touch base with her, but I'll also uh, try to get a hold of their people. And, and I'll be going to that too, Dan. Great. Great. So I'll, I'll bring mine too, as well. Awesome. That's terrific. So again, I want to uh, thank Kirk for uh, hopping aboard and Dan, yeah. give a round of applause to Dan Taylor. No, thanks guys. Thank you very much. Dan, it was really fabulous. And uh, if I would use one word, it would be enlightening. I don't think anybody uh, knew what was all the stuff going on. So can't wait to read the book and we'll be in touch, all right? Thanks, Gary. Appreciate I it. will Take care, uh, hang guys. out here, talk about uh, some Giants if you want for a little bit. Otherwise, we'll see each other next wednesday with uh, chasing yeah. willie mays um by paul kosak great book so have a great night everybody and uh be well dan you're the best thanks dan, thanks gary thank you. you are great night hey, gary yes I, um, I took a screenshot of dan's information so i'll send oh. it to you you won't have to have to look through oh, it thanks. That, that, that's great because it takes like a few hours for the uh, the recording to cook per se. So that'd be great. I'm just going to add another that was question. Awesome. 